Shalom from Jerusalem. This is TV7's Israel at War update. And today is the 44th day since the Islamist terror groups from the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip launched an onslaught of Israel, declaring war by committing a massacre, causing thousands of casualties. Now, as we continue to update you here from Jerusalem, and before we turn to our editor at large, I'd like to, uh, first of all, update on a specific report that was published in various circles around the world regarding Israel demanding of Christian communities in the Gaza Strip to move southward. Uh, according to various authorities that we have communicated with thus far, we have received that this is fake news, and therefore this uh, can be refuted at this stage. Nevertheless, we are continuing down the rabbit hole to figure out all the circumstances of this report, and therefore, we will come back to you with additional information on this. Let's then now turn to our TV7 editor-at-large, Mr. Amir Oren. Thank you for joining us, sir. Uh, could you provide us with the latest, please? Yes, Jonathan, you uh, are probably referring to the fact that uh, while uh, there is uh, quite a large uh, majority of Arabs who are Muslims, 90% or more, Nevertheless, there is still a significant minority of Christians and perhaps um, other uh, religions. And uh, obviously, they are sometimes persecuted by their fellow Arabs, the Muslims, and therefore uh, special care should be given them. Now, um, as you said, this is the 44th day of the war and uh, the uh, fighting continues uh, in Gaza, especially in the north and uh, north central parts uh, of uh, the strip, Gaza City, some very tough neighborhoods where um, infantry, uh, paratroopers and others, uh, armor and engineers, uh, along with special forces, are methodically working the way uh, from community to community in search of both Hamas um, fighters, the arsenal, and obviously the hostages. Uh, the same goes uh, for the northern border, where uh, the Israeli Air Force has struck targets in response to the uh, Hezbollah launching of uh, anti-tank guided missiles, mortar shells, and uh, other uh, sorts of uh, attack. But uh, the newest development comes from the Red Sea, where the Houthis uh, have taken over a car carrier um, owned by a British company registered in the Isle of Man, flying uh, the Bahamas flag, has no connection to Israel, um, and um, it has uh, earlier sailed from Japan through the uh, Suez Canal to Turkey, now on its way back, has already traversed the Suez Canal and uh, was about to uh, go to uh, um, a port in India when uh, it was intercepted by the Houthis who hoped to find some Israeli connection to it. There is no Israeli connection, but the IDF spokesman has warned the Houthis and called on the international community to respond because this is a grave breach of uh, maritime etiquette. And uh, if one may add, Israeli patience with the Houthis uh, is coming to its end. Up to now, Israel, along with the United States, only defended against such attacks. But obviously, at one point, it will also go on a counteroffensive. Mr. Olin, if I may follow up on this uh, uh, latter point. And where is the United States, where is the maritime, uh, joint maritime uh, task force that was established together with the United Kingdom, with uh, France, with other European powers that had quite the, the impressive contingent for many years operating in those waterways. You can add China to it. Uh, and at one time, China uh, took its turn in leading uh, this force. The Commodore was Chinese, and there are three Chinese uh, uh, Navy uh, ships always uh, there. Uh, recently, uh, the uh, new uh, batch of three was coming to replace the old ones. So for a moment, there were six Chinese Navy ships, and it caused some consternation as if the Chinese are, are uh, trying to bolster their naval presence. Now, the Americans 
uh, have up to now only defended uh, when Israel was attacked or when there was some danger to their own uh, ship. Uh, a few days ago, the American uh, destroyer, the Thomas Hudner, um, its captain saw um, a Houthi drone getting uh, too close uh, for comfort to uh, his ship and ordered it down, even though there was no attack yet. So apparently, when uh, this particular action against the uh, uh, galaxy leader comes, the, uh, the response uh, is going to be uh, much harsher. Uh, they will not stand aside. We will hear from international bodies, including the United States. Thank you, Mr. Owen. I think it's very important for all of our viewers at home to understand this. I encourage you, go into your maps. If you have a map, if not, go to the internet and look where Yemen is located. Look at the Red Sea. Look at the Bab el Mandab Straits, which uh, are adjacent uh, to this uh, landmass. And ultimately, when we're talking about the Houthis, the Houthis are merely a tribe that controls the organization called Ansar Allah. It's an alliance of various tribes who've pledged allegiance and full cooperation with the Islamic Republic of Iran and have thus far received quantities of military hardware uh, of which they have fired multiple rockets deliberately on vital infrastructure throughout the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And during this war, uh, over the past 44 days, there have been also projectiles launched from Yemen towards southern Israel. Let's turn, therefore, also to uh, the commander of the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Air and Missile Defense, Brigadier General in Reserve, Doron Gavish. General Gavish, uh, the complexities arising out of uh, Yemen are quite uh, robust. Uh, it is growing in measure, of course. Where are you seeing this right now, and what is this cooperation with CENTCOM able to... to uh, somehow secure a certain challenge uh, for the sake of the protection of Israel, but also the waterways. Well, you're right, uh, Jonathan. Uh, CENCOM uh, role is uh, huge, of course. The, this is the area that uh, the CENCOM um, as a command is in charge of, and there are a lot of assets uh, which are there, but also some other uh, coalition nations, I would say, that uh, are in this area, as you mentioned uh, before. I think that what we could say about this is that uh, the Houthis are showing again that they are a terrorist organization, same as the Hezbollah, same as the Hamas, and everything is being orchestrated by Iran. And, uh, you know, uh, you fight terrorism as you fight terrorism. And I'm sure that uh, the time uh, for the Houthis uh, to be fought, uh, it will come. Um, Basically, it's, uh, it is probably more something that uh, Israel for this particular time, uh, uh, we are concentrated in the war that we have here in uh, the Gaza Strip and uh, preventing the war from the north part of uh, Israel. But for sure, this is something that we should continuously have uh, to look at. Uh, but uh, this is one of the, the main reasons why the cooperation is uh, so important uh, because for sure, if there would be a decision by the United States that uh, they want to uh, uh, to take care of uh, this uh, threat, uh, I'm sure that they uh, could do it. So it's a, it's a basically a matter of uh, decision. Th this is uh, for this uh, area. Uh, for the southern part of uh, Israel, for the Gaza Strip, uh, uh, you know, we, we talked yesterday uh, about the fight and what is going on. So we know for that in the last uh, 24, almost uh, 48 hours, uh, the IDF is uh, fighting against the uh, Hamas and uh, is entering uh, two main neighborhoods, I would say. The, one of them is called Zaytun. Uh, uh, the other one is uh, Jabalia. And uh, what we have to know about this is that the way that the Hamas is organized, although it is a terrorist organization, is uh, organized like a small military. And they have battalions which are in charge on those uh, large neighborhoods. Some of them are small cities very close to, to the Gaza Strip. So there is a fight over there. Uh, we know that the Hamas had a lot of uh, casualties in the next, uh, in the last uh, 40 hour, 48 hours. And uh, this fight is going uh, to go on uh, probably for 
uh, more uh, for, for, for the days to come. Uh, we see the fight as we know it uh, by the IDF, very, very methodology, uh, very precise. Uh, we see the IDF uh, striking the Hamas target and then uh, very uh, working with a very close support with the ground forces. And this is still going on uh, also in those uh, areas. Thank you, General Kavish. Two points that I think are very important to be made. First, uh, Ansar Allah, namely the Houthi uh, tribe and uh, its affiliates, are not a terrorist organization. They were designated as a foreign terrorist organization under the Trump administration by uh, the Secretary of State at the time, Mike Pompeo, uh, who uh, designated them roughly a month and a half before leaving office. And this was revocated by the incumbent administration, the Biden administration, Secretary of State Antony Blinken, immediately. It was less than a month uh, before, uh, after he entered office, decided to remove them from the terrorist organization. Therefore, under U.S. law, they're not recognized as a terrorist organization, nor are they designated as such in uh, Europe. The second point, I think, that is yeah, very important. Yeah, but, but you know, uh, Jonathan, if they were they were not look at, it doesn't mean that they are not. Because course, if you look on the way that they are acting, they are acting exactly as a terrorist organization. And of course, the last, uh, the last act. Unfortunately, uh, you're right. But un uh, again, unfortunately, when we're talking about the laws of war, they're not a terrorist organization. And therefore, if we want to make this change, the United States, European nations need to come together and realize that what they see is what they get and what they hope to see is not necessarily what is reality on the ground. And therefore, for the same matter, we hear more and more, if we're talking now about the Gaza Strip, we hear more and more leaders throughout the region and beyond saying that Israel is committing crimes and so on and so forth. No, uh, Israel is not committing crimes against uh, humanity, not crimes of war. It is abiding by the laws of war, and it's quite clear, and people need to understand this, that even though they say this time and time again, uh, with all due respect, the Geneva Convention is quite clear, the laws of war are quite clear about the way to conduct uh, one's military in times of war, and Israel is going be, uh, beyond the boundaries of what it needs to do in order to ensure the safety of the civilians, to ensure that hospitals remain functioning despite not having to do so, it goes out of its way to do so. Now let's turn to Helsinki, Finland, where we're joined by uh, the former foreign minister and deputy prime minister of Finland, uh, Mr. Timo Soini. It's good to have you, sir. I'd like to ask you, since Finland has also had to deal with uh, both the, the complexities that uh, is called Yemen on the one hand with uh, an incumbent member of parliament, formerly a student in Yemen, uh, being kidnapped by Al-Qaeda at the time together with uh, his wife and then uh, needing yeah. to barter in that circumstances in order to free the, uh, the uh, two uh, Finns from that circumstance, something that is rampant. There are a lot of kidnappings, there's a lot of malign activity being done by those uh, Houthis and Yemen uh, in general. And then when we're talking about the Gaza Strip, where is the international community right now? When we're seeing the, the concrete efforts being done in order to ensure that the terrorist organization that committed the heinous crimes of October 7th is eliminated. Yeah, this is uh, getting uh, complicated uh, in the international scene because people are wondering uh, uh, that uh, what is really happening and like you said this study by the brutal attack uh, uh, carried out by Hamas to the civil uh, people in Israel 1400 dead and uh, uh, the, a, a big amount of wounded and everything else this is the whole core point of the of the what we are witnessing now but uh, in the in the media and also in the Western politics, it seems to be the the so-called narrative that they are both both guilty, and and that is when you are describing this in the political scene. It's usually you must uh, put those uh, both Hamas and Israel in the same sentence, 
And uh, it was good that when you said uh, about this uh, Yemen uh, and, and everything else, what we talk about, this is the, the tactics of terrorist organization and their supporters and proxies to open as many fronts as possible up north and also now the seaways uh, to, in, to enlarge the, the conflict in that sense that if this goes on, there will be consequences to the maritime, to the seaways, to the commercial things. And then this is uh, the main, main tactics to, to make this more and more diverse in order to forget what was the reason, how did this began, and so forth. And also now, I'm quite satisfied that how unanimously the European countries have functioned thus far. But there is a growing uh, uh, lines uh, to challenge that the unity. And, and this is because of all, all um, news, civilians lost, uh, children uh, uh, died and uh, killed and, and so forth. And, and as, we, as we know, there was years and years of activities funded by Qatar and maybe somebody else's who put a lot of uh, uh, focal points to the campuses in United States and in Western Europe. So when where the critics comes to the Israel, also this kind of rhetoric from the land to the sea, that the, the choir boys are usually in the campuses. And then also the media people, they have also been trained or graduated by these campuses. And this is also challenging in the media ways as well. And I think this is also a growing problem. And that's, that is why the correct information, like you stressed before, what has really happened it a matter of utmost importance because otherwise the false fake news uh, goes uh, very rapid way onwards and they are manipulating the minds uh, of the people also in Western world. Thank you, Mr. Soini. I think it's very important to highlight what you just noted. The fact of the matter is uh, when we're talking about a country like Qatar, a country that is under immense investigation, the so-called Qatargate throughout the European Union, with over 160 members of parliament under current suspicion of gaining bribes by Qatar, uh, a country yeah. that has bought vital infrastructure throughout Europe, football teams to try and uh, boost itself up within uh, European uh, perceptions, uh, has invested heavily, as you noted, in campuses, not only in the United States, but also in Europe, and has Austria. invested quite substantively also in the, the news business, which has transformed from news into business channels in 2003, we could see quite the a rise of, of investments made by Qatar Doha in the various Western nations, understanding full well that uh, it may find itself in a point where crucial decisions will ultimately take into account its way. And therefore, when we're looking at this situation, disinformation needs to be combated by the leaders who are responsible for the nations who are infected by this disease. But let's turn to Mr. Oren as we also have to uh, cover the northern arena. Uh, Mr. Oren, where is the current situation vis-a-vis -vis Hezbollah, Lebanon? We saw the attacks on the American forces in both Syria and Iraq, something that continues to occur despite American uh, uh, deterrence, so to speak, or at least uh, attempts to deter the enemy. Where is everything at this point? Well, it seems that uh, all sides, both uh, along the Lebanese border and in the Syria-Iraq theater, which you referred to, are going through the motions. The uh, pro-Iranian uh, militias, uh, some of uh, whom uh, were designated by the Treasury and State Departments uh, only recently, such as uh, Kataib, Hezbollah, and several others, which means that their leaders 
could not go to New York uh, anytime soon, uh, a severe punishment. Uh, but uh, in any event, uh, the attacks have not been lethal. Uh, should uh, a U.S. serviceman, a contractor or a civilian be killed, um, President Biden uh, has promised um, a much more forceful response. And by the way, uh, tomorrow President Biden turns 81. I know that you, Jonathan, um, of all people, um, are going to congratulate him and uh, uh, bless him uh, for many happy returns. And um, he has uh, uh, today published an op-ed piece uh, in the uh, Washington Post laying out his vision for um, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Now, uh, you may remember that President Woodrow Wilson uh, in World War I said that uh, this is going to be the war to end all wars. Um, he was slightly misinformed, it turns out. President Biden wants to uh, this particular war between Israel and Hamas to be the last war between Israelis and Palestinians. And therefore, he is putting forward his framework of having a Palestinian state, which when reinvigorated, uh, this is a, a term that former Prime Minister Salam Fayyad uh, put into circulation, uh, it will take over in Gaza too. So uh, right now we are, see the, we are seeing the fighting in Gaza and uh, the end state, according to President Biden, is going uh, to be uh, rosy. Uh, how do we get from point A to point B uh, remains to be resolved. With regard to your remark uh, to Biden, I will uh, just say that as a Christian, obviously, we're commanded to pray for all our leaders, regardless of who they are. And uh, we'll leave it at that. With regard to your latter <laughs> point, uh, we need to understand that uh, even Salam Fayyad, who I had the privilege of speaking with him more than once, uh, understood full well that uh, many within the Palestinian street are not keen on a two-state solution as Biden so ardently aspires to, rather a one-state solution, hoping that demography will do its own work for them. But uh, let's turn also to the commander uh, of uh, the Israeli Air Force Task Force for Air and Missile Defense, uh, Brigadier General uh, Doron Gavish. Doron, when we're looking at uh, the Northern Theater, we're looking at Iraq, we're looking at Syria, uh, what goes through your mind seeing the, the motions currently at play? Well, but, but first of all, I have to say, uh, Jonathan, that also in Judaism, every day in the, in the synagogue, you should pray for your uh, leader. So it's probably, I'm not, I'm not sure if it is the same in, in other uh, religions, but for sure in Christianity and also in, in Judaism. Uh, you know, lo looking into the north, uh, it, it is really looking into the east. Uh, the big question is uh, is Iran, and uh, and and we 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 see what is uh, happening uh, around now. Uh, we see the the hands and the fingers of the Iranians uh, in in Lebanon, in Syria, in in Yemen, and and so on. So, I think this is really uh, the, one of the main challenges that uh, if you know the United States is is the leader of the worst uh, world, but. Uh, um, but not only the United States, I think that everyone should uh, look at the Iran and ask himself uh, what would be the next step, what is the real way that uh, should be, uh, um, or what is the, the right behavior uh, for the Iran. Uh, we hear about all kinds of agreements and, and so on. And uh, we see that there is a lot of evil and uh, terrorism uh, that is coming uh, for Iran. And this is really the main, the main uh, challenge. So. You know, when I'm looking on the north, I'm basically looking into the, I'm looking to the east, and, and I think that this should be the main uh, challenge uh, uh, worldwide uh, after this uh, world. Looking directly to the north, of course, the Hezbollah, uh, we understand that uh, this war cannot be ended uh, while the Hezbollah is still on the Israeli border. Uh, we have to remember that there are Israelis that have been evacuated thousands of them, that uh, tens of thousands of them that have be, been evacuated uh, from the border. We saw what happened uh, when we had the uh, terrorists like the 
Hamas in the south part of the border. So uh, uh, I think that there is no question that uh, the Lebanese question uh, would be part of the answers that we would have to give ourselves as part of this uh, large uh, war that, uh, uh, long war that uh, we foresee. Thank you, General Gavish. Mr. Soini, with the Islamic Republic of Iran, quite uh, frankly, utilizing all of its tools in order to destabilize the West, going from supporting Russia yeah. in its war of aggression against Ukraine, uh, talking about uh, the ongoing conflicts uh, throughout this region, not only with regard to Israel, but also Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and others in the region. Why is Europe standing idly by and doing, quite frankly, almost nothing when we're talking about this matter? In the longer run, uh, I, I think that uh, the Western leaders were thinking that this uh, problem uh, should and would go by, 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 by itself, but it won't. And there is, uh, of course, uh, Iranian oil is a big factor also to China and and this is why China uh, also back backs uh, Russia and 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 uh, Russia's for fight against Ukraine because it's need uh, Chinese China needs Iranian oil and and the more there are sanctions on Iran it also indirectly uh, has uh, consequences to China. And uh, also quite uh, many countries before uh, those uh, uh, war-like uh, happenings uh, were improving their uh, commercial ties to Iran because it is a vast market. But uh, there is also the, the cable between uh, Russia and Iran is significant. Uh, also what, uh, what comes to Syria, because they both were the biggest supporters of uh, al-Assad regime in Syria. And this is kind of the, the, the package, what, what they have. And this... Uh, European style and, and thinking, uh, Western thinking, usually comes from the philosophy that when you increase information and you increase commerce and business ties, this will lead to the preferable uh, outcome. But uh, the people in the West forget that in Iran, it's a religious uh, uh, ideology, and also in Russia, it's a, uh, uh, it's a Russian entity, which is considered in those countries bigger than money. And the Western people think that money is more important than religion and, uh, and ideology, but it seems not to be the case. Thank you, Mr. Soini. Uh, well, this is all the time that we have for today. I'd like to immediately thank you indeed, Mr. Soini, for taking out of your time, as well as General Gavish and Mr. Oren as ever. I'd like to thank all of you at home as well. Until the next update from here in Jerusalem. Shalom. Lerman. I used to be Deputy National Security Advisor to the Government of Israel, currently Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, a think tank, and the editor of the Jerusalem Strategic Tribune. For the last few years, I've been a regular panelist for TV7, a fantastic opportunity to bring deep and analytical perspectives to the debate over regional affairs, Israeli affairs, international affairs, in the company of some of the best minds in Israel.